good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, ninth debate now of Lent term and the final one this evening. Uh, this House supports another referendum on Britain's membership of the EU, and inadvertently, a topical motion here. Uh, first of all, a small apology in that you might have noticed a couple of the uh, speakers are looking slightly more youthful than the advertised ones. That is a, you must imagine, the results of today mean some uh, parliamentary uh, politicians may have had to drop out at the very last minute, so we're very grateful for two Zoom speakers dropping in. Uh, this is our last debate of term, and that does mean that it is time to hand over the committee just before we can start off with the main debate. So, first of all then, as a uh, social events officer, Sam Longton was handing over to Emma Jing. <laughs> as treasurer, Vincent Rustill is handing over to Jamie Civiter. Our Speaker's Officer, Cecily Bateman, is going to be handing over, but she can't, unfortunately can't be here this evening, so Joy, our outgoing debating officer, is taking her place and handing over to Adam Davies. <laughs> As Executive Officer, Rachel Tustin is handing over to Hanine Zeglum. And finally, I'm handing over the President's Chair to Abdullah Shah. Yeah, thank you. Good luck. Thank you everyone for coming to tonight's debate. Um, the motion before the House today, as well said, is this House supports another referendum on Britain's membership of the EU. So, without further ado, I invite the first speaker of the proposition, Will Smart. Will is a fourth year student at Peterhouse and the outgoing president of the Cambridge Union, as you might have guessed by now. So, <laughs> Will. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. President, and good luck to the rest of your committee for your upcoming term. I'm sure you will do a fantastic job. Now, I almost feel I should start uh, my remarks this evening with a bit of an apology for choosing this topic as my final debate and for inflicting yet more Brexit upon some innocent people. Uh, Brexit is boring, and I rather stu stupidly given myself the task of trying to say something new and interesting about it. Uh, if there's one point the opposition could make this evening, which I will happily concede, is that no one in their right mind would actually look forward to another referendum with all of the uh, campaigning, repetitive television debates and misleading statistics that that would entail. Uh, but we're having this debate anyway this evening because Brexit has plunged this country into a crisis and it, deser and, and it deserves the House's attention. It's over a year since the Union has last debated uh, this issue and quite a bit has changed in that time. When we started planning this term's debate and we realised the last one would take place only 15 days before the 29th of March, there was no way we could really justify discussing any other issue. Back in October when this motion was decided upon, we expected it to be something of a placeholder. I'd assumed something would change. Maybe a deal would be done and we'd be ready to leave on the 29th, as originally planned. Maybe a general election or another referendum would have been called and we'd be discussing that instead. But nothing has changed, and months later, nearly three years after the first referendum, no one has a clue what's going to happen next, and we're only 15 days away from leaving. Which leads me to the key questions the opposition uh, must answer tonight, which is that, is this what really people really voted for? And when were people told when they went to the polls three years ago, that never, uh, years of never-ending discussions about custom use, customs unions and backstops later, we would still be no clearer to knowing what our future relationship with the European Union would actually be. So much has been made about the lies in the last referendum campaign, and if we wanted to, my side could spend our entire speeches listing and refuting all the uh, extraordinary claims that Leave Camp made. Uh, but we won't, because you've most heard most of those before, and that's not what this debate is about. But there is one that may have escaped your attention, and that's that the official Leave campaign itself promised, and I quote, that we will negotiate the terms of a new deal before we start any legal process to leave. Now, of course, that didn't happen. Theresa May triggered, triggered Article 50 two years ago, and we still haven't got a deal. We, the public, simply didn't know what we were getting ourselves in for, and I count myself among that. I still don't know what's going on. I don't think anybody really does. I followed the negotiations uh, in Westminster and Brussels as closely as anybody can be expected to, and I've long so uh, since stopped taking any of it in. 
is exhausting and it's fruitless and it's easy to forget that it's not something we are being forced to do. Unlike the genuinely important issue, uh, problems that the country faces, from climate change to housing or social care, we could fix it all overnight if we wished to. So this was meant to uh, be a path that would set us on, uh, on the free path to pursue a glorious future, and it has failed and made us a global laughing stock. We've lost influence and credibility entirely of our own accord. We've given up, we've given up any pretense that Brexit would give us possibly give us any benefits as a nation. We've crippled our businesses with tariffs and regulations, voluntarily pursuing policies we know will harm our own economy, and we're forcibly stripping millions of people, including the majority of people in this room, of a, citizen, of a citizenship that they've held since birth. And there's only one reason we're doing that, and that's because the people voted, 17.4 million of them. So that's the largest mandate for anything in British electoral history, and their wishes must be respected, and I will agree, which is why I'm proposing another referendum tonight, with a clear choice between the best deal the government can uh, negotiate and remaining a full member of the EU. It would be the only way of changing course that the British public will accept as legitimate. This part of the debate is well rehearsed. The Remainer says that the last vote was a mistake, the Brexiteer says the Remainer hates democracy and doesn't respect the will of the people, and, and that brings us to another question for the opposition to ask, answer, which is what is so bad about asking the are you sure? How is it a betrayal of democracy at all to give people the chance to vote again? There's this notion that by asking again, the elites would be telling the public that the most important vote they've made in their lives no longer means anything. That simply doesn't bear scrutiny. The votes had been barely been counted in June 2016 before they'd forced the Prime Minister to resign. Since then, his success has turned the entire machinery of the British state towards uh, devising the best way to leave the European Union. Two new departments were formed, thousands of civil servants were tasked with preparing the country for exit, and the Prime Minister's entire premiership has been staked on making a success of it. By any reasonable measure, the votes of those 17.4 million people mattered. The problem wasn't with them, but with the question. With advocates of the softest possible Norway or Switzerland-style Brexit, having to vote for exactly the, same as, uh, exactly the same way as those who favor leaving without a deal at all. In this context, letting the people vote again isn't ignoring them, but an essential way of ensuring that their voices aren't lost. It's hardly surprising that a recent YouGov poll showed that 75% of Labour voters in the North support another referendum. So that's not just North London or so on, but the actual North and Labour voters. Nor is it surprising that the People's Vote rally last October was one of the largest in British political history. Of course this issue divides the public, but there's nothing elitist about people who fear for their jobs and the country's future being asked to, uh, asking for the chance to have their voices heard. It's easy to forget just how much the meaning of Brexit has changed since the first referendum was announced. Back then, only the so-called hard Brexiteers were genuinely advocating for leaving the single market and customs union. There used to be something called a soft Brexit, whereby the UK would leave, but otherwise it align itself closely with the European bloc. Apparently, many leavers back then didn't object to the economic union of union, the issue was solely of the political union. And then Theresa May came to power and imposed a set of red lines. She made no attempt to reflect the closeness of the vote or the range of opinions on the leave side. When she set these conditions, she did so presuming to speak for the people and what they voted for, but she could only ever speak for leavers and only ever then only some of them. The views of 48% of people were ignored entirely. So what were these red lines? Well, first, under no circum circumstances was the UK to make any significant financial contributions to the EU budget, which immediately ruled out any sort of Norway-style deal. Secondly, there was going to be no free, free movement of people, so sod the right to live, work, and holiday in 27 other EU uh, nation states. Theresa May thinks immigrants are bad, so out goes any sort of Swiss-style relationship too. If for some reason you fancy a Ukrainian-style relationship with the EU, May's uh, red line of not allowing the European Court of Justice any influence has ruled that out too. And likewise, even Turkey's deal is too good for her because that doesn't quite give us full autonomy over trading relationships. And so before negotiations had even started, Brexit began to mean something very different than what it had during the campaign. And the national debate has nat uh, naturally shifted with it. Not everyone's been included. It's just the same faces on television time and time again parading out before the cameras on Paris Green. If the Rees Moggs, maybe some Remainer MP, Labour MP trying to explain how the Labour Party would handle things much better, basically just because they're not Tories. Maybe Boris Johnson or David Davis, and maybe Vince Cable if somebody can wake him up. Occasionally, Channel 4 News will interview somebody around a table in a pub, but that's about the closest it gets for any normal people to have their say. Despite this debate never seeming to end, it's just man managed to just exclude just about everybody in this country. Now, I'm actually quite embarrassed that my final debate uh, here at the Union is, uh, uh, features an all-male lineup, and we have to, just have to take my word for it that we tried very hard to prevent that being the case. But 
awful as this is on its own terms, in its way, it actually ends up being quite fitting since the national debate has happened on a very similar basis. As the People's Vote campaign has uh, pointed out, there's only one woman in the UK's senior negotiating team in Brussels, only one woman sitting on the, alongside 43 men on the board of Leave Means Leave, and barely a quarter of parliamentary speaking time during Brexit debates have been allocated to women. Now that's bad enough in its own terms, but really it speaks to a much deeper problem about whose voices are being sidelined. Our politics has been driven to the extremes and moderate voices have been drowned out. Everyone talks about ordinary voters, but that phrase has long since stopped meaning anything important and is increasingly used to merely as an excuse to drown out dissenting voices, which in this case, case amounts to at least 48% of the population. So another referendum is needed so that everybody can speak again with an equal voice. And finally, I should finish by referencing the uh, events in Parliament this evening. Uh, and the fact, that, uh, the fact that another referendum is now essential in order to uh, reflect the will of the House of Commons. Barely two hours ago, they uh, voted to extend the Article 50 process and asked the EU for that extension until the end of June. The EU have said very clearly that they will not accept any request to extend the Article 50 process unless something is different. Unless we can't just go back again asking for the same deal for the third time or the fourth time as Theresa May seems to intend. We must go back and tell the EU that there's a reason why they want to give us more time. And frankly, another referendum and the campaign timing required for that is the only legitimate reason for doing so. So I hope on the basis of this, I have convinced you, or if anybody here is actually ever going to likely to change their mind in this debate, which is unlikely, <laughs> to at least, if you are, do support the motion to join the marches on 23rd of March in London and support the motion before the House this evening. Thank you. Thank you for that speech, Will. Um, the next speaker from Team Opposition will be Daniel Han. Daniel is a prominent Eurosceptic and one of the founders of Vote Leave. Daniel has been the Conservative MEP for Southeast England since 1999. Daniel, the floor is yours. Oh. <coughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Welcome to your chair. And I wouldn't begin with an apology in your position. Well, I think you timed this brilliantly. In fact, it, it could have hardly been apter to have had this debate on whether to have a second referendum on the very night, at the very moment, that Parliament is debating the same question. But I think the result on that vote may have slipped your attention because you, you mentioned that they've requested an extension. You didn't mention that they also voted on whether to have a second referendum. And after all the huffing and puffing, the mountains heaved and brought forth a mouse. Only 75 members of parliament voted to have a second referendum. So I'd come here prepared, yes, of course. Well, parliament is a sovereign entity, right? And parliament has now voted very clearly that it doesn't want a second referendum. And I suspect that that's gonna remain the case. Now, there may well be an argument, uh, as the former president was saying, for using the extension to look at a way to build a consensus. I agree, I to absolutely concede this. I think the, the failure to reach out to the very large minority who had voted remain was an obvious criticism to make of this government's approach. But to say, as Will just did, we've had all this uncertainty, we still don't know where we are. I know what we're gonna do, let's have a referendum. I mean, come on, one or the other. Either you're fed up with the uncertainty or you want a referendum, but please, not both at the same time in subsequent sentences in the same speech. And I, I find myself here now, rather than needing to come and make a case uh, from first principles, I find myself preaching uh, a panegyric over the coffin of the referendum because MPs have done their duty. It's perfectly true, I'm sure you're going to hear from other speakers on the proposition tonight, that we're a parliamentary democracy. Certainly the case, in law, by convention, by all of our uh, historical understanding, that Parliament couldn't uh, overturn uh, a public vote. That's absolutely right. But this particular Parliament has exercised its sovereignty in a particular way. In May of 2015, Parliament voted by 544 to 53 to put the question of whether or not to remain in the European Union to the country. That was its sovereign decision, and it didn't add any codicils. It didn't tack on any riders. It didn't say, but if we don't get the answer we want, we might come back 
and ask you a second time. There were no such amendments. On the contrary, both the Parliament and the government were absolutely emphatic and unambiguous that that was going to be the only vote. A great deal of taxpayers' money was spent on behalf of the government sending a pamphlet to every household in the country to make the case for a Remain vote. And it concluded, having run through all of the government's reasons for why it thought we should vote Remain, it concluded with these words, this is your decision, the government will implement what you decide. Now, did any of you object at the time? Was there any uh, dissenting voice in Parliament, any dissenting voice in the Lords or Commons, people said, well, actually, uh, now that I've got this leaflet, I just want to put on the record that if I, 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 I don't get the result I want, we should have a second round. Au contraire, as we old Brussels hands say. In fact, to remove any doubt, the Prime Minister of the time, David Cameron, remember David Cameron, he was Prime Minister at, at that time, he made a speech at Chatham House in which, I'll quote, he said, it will be the final decision. To those who suggest a second referendum, he said, think again. The referendum is a once-in-a-generation decision. When the British people speak, their voice must be respected. Did anyone put in an objection? Did anyone say, I want it put on the record that I disagree with what David Cameron is saying? Andrew Adonis or A.C. Grayling or Nick Clay, Did any of these people say, well, actually, no, I'm not sure about that. I think this may have to be just one of a series. Of course not. Both sides pledged themselves in advance to respect the outcome, whatever it was. And I'm bound to say, the people who made that pledge in the most vivid way, one might almost say the most aggressive way, were those campaigning for Remain. I remember Lord Ashdown saying, no one will forgive anyone who asks for a second referendum. This, of course, was before the result came in. I remember John Major going on air and saying, there is absolutely no way you can come back and ask for a second go. We'd be laughed at in Brussels. It's not a run. Yes, of course, sir. I would like to remind you that we have already had a second referendum. The first referendum was held before most of you were born in, I think, 1975, and it voted decisively to remain, and the Brexiteers have been trying to get a second referendum to change that result ever since. Well, actually, that's not the case. The, the Brexiteers absolutely accepted the result, and it was only when there was a change in the terms of our membership, when, the, when we ceased to be members of the European Economic Community and became citizens of the European Union under Maastricht, that there began a campaign for a second referendum. So absolutely, guys, if you want to accept this result and come back after 20 years and begin a campaign and then after another 20 years have a third referendum, absolutely fine. In that sense, I agree with the questioner. But let's implement the result of this one before we start asking for another vote. I have to say, I, I can remember, there, some of you may know that there is a, another university some way west of here that doesn't have uh, quite the standing that you do in the international rankings, but it does have a, a, a union, a debating society like this, a slightly larger one than this, I'm bound to uh, observe. And, and during the referendum campaign, Nick Clegg, who was then the Lib Dem, remember Nick Clegg? Yeah? Uh, Nick, Nick Clegg came and he made a speech, and actually it, 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 it is a, a, a piece now available on YouTube that is so funny, a piece of irony so beautiful that it should hang in the National Gallery, where he doesn't just promise to accept the result. He goes off on this huge riff about these terrible people who are not going to accept the result. And he, you know that Cleggie talks in cliche, and he starts, he starts going on and on about, oh, they're going to be like those Japanese in the Pacific who nobody had informed that the war had ended. They're still going to be going on and on and on about it years after it's finished. Of course, it was a grisly premonition of how Clegg himself was going to spend the next two years. But how on earth, after having listened to all of that from all of the remainder, how can we now take seriously the same people when they come back and say, yeah, we know we said last time that this was it. We know we said it was a once-in-a-generation opportunity. We know we said that, but this time we really mean it. This time, if we have just one more vote, it really is going to be final and binding. Come on, guys, what? And if you don't get your, your, the way you want on the next one, what, best of three, best of five? Maybe a regular series, like The Ashes. I mean, how many times are we going to have this question before people accept the results? And I tell you, it wouldn't settle anything. And we just, actually, we ju we'll just let the cat out of the bag there when he said it should be a referendum between the dreadful terms that Theresa May is negotiating or staying in. In other words, leave, proper leave, wouldn't be on the ballot paper at all. 
So the only consequence of a referendum of that sort is that leavers would boycott it because they would say, hang on, guys, first of all, you all told us that it was it last time, so we're not going to dignify this rerun with our participation. But anyway, even if we wanted to, you haven't put leave on the ballot paper. So you would end up, one assumes, with a kind of 96% remain vote on a kind of 40% turnout. What would that solve? Absolutely nothing. But it would, yeah, of course. No, I'm not trying to rule it out. Uh, there were, look, by definition, there was a, it was a national referendum, so there were 17.4 million people who voted leave. Of course they had a variety of ideas, just as the people who voted remain had different views about how the European Union should develop if we stayed. That's the essence of a referendum. So I'm not arguing that this isn't uh, 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 leave. It's certainly not the way I would have done it, but of course, Anything that takes us out of the European Union is leaving. And I've been open to, you know, uh, to EFTA, to the Chequers deal. I, I actually, the one thing I agree with is I think there, there was a, uh, a failure to, f to seek for a consensus that both sides could have got behind. And it shouldn't have been beyond us to have found a way of leaving the political aspects of European uh, Union membership while retaining close economic links. It's, a, it's a, uh, a missed opportunity. But I tell you, there is blame on all sides for that one. If both sides had behaved rationally, if Remainers had said, okay, we lost, but here are the bits that we want to preserve, and if Leavers then come back and said, all right, if you're being reasonable, we're being reasonable, these are the bits that we're prepared to concede on, we might have had a national consensus. Sadly, one side went off on demanding a second referendum, the other side then responded by saying, we, we, uh, we want the toughest of Brexit. This is gonna have to be the last one, I'm afraid, go on. Do you know when the People's Vote campaign actually launched? The People's Vote campaign. Yes, calling for a second referendum. Given what, what was the last one? A Penguin's vote? An Aardvark's vote? So I find you, the name slightly well, objectionable. You're, su you're suggesting that they started immediately after the referendum um, result came in. Well, the date, yeah. The, I mean, the weekend after, the, so the vote was, uh, uh, was on a, a Thursday, I think. The, the, that weekend, I spoke to a, a rather larger audience than this in London, and everyone was demanding a second referendum. I think the campaign began almost immediately. There was that march, if you remember, calling for a, a rerun within days of the uh, initial referendum result, calling for a re So yes, people were not prepared to accept the outcome. And the result, I'm afraid, is that we saw a polarization after the poll that we hadn't actually seen during it. I actually remember the referendum itself being fairly good-natured. I remember having street stalls where there were Remainers and Leavers coming and, and chatting, and it was all perfectly amicable until the result came in. And that began this rather uh, un-British polarization. But I'm getting sidetracked, so please allow me just to come back in the, the brief minutes I have left to the question of why a second referendum, far from solving anything, will continue to prolong uncertainty and to do damage to our international standing and to the legitimacy of our institutions. The idea of a second referendum, if it had simply been a domestic argument, if it had simply been a way of trying to wriggle out of the promises that had been made before the first one, would have done a certain amount of damage to the standing of our parliament, to the legitimacy of our system of government. But unfortunately, it wasn't only a domestic question. People across the channel are perfectly capable of reading British newspapers and following UK broadcasts. And the clamor for a second referendum had the obvious effect of disincentivizing Brussels from engaging in any serious negotiations that might have resulted in a compromise solution that would have benefited both the EU and the UK. Why, after all, if you're told that there's no need to concede anything because if you hold the line, the Brits will come back and might say, and why would you even begin to engage seriously in negotiations? There was an article in Le Point a couple of months ago, the French magazine, in which my, uh, Michel Barnier was quoted saying to fellow EU leaders in 2016, I will have done my job if in the end the exit terms are so hard that the Brits would rather stay in. You might say that a certain coldness on the part of the European Union in response to a Brexit vote was to be anticipated. Fair enough. But something that I don't think was to be expected was the readiness of elected British parliamentarians 
despite the promises they'd earlier made, to collude with the European Union in an attempt to overturn the largest vote in British history. Let me remind you that after the referendum, in 2017, there was a general election in which both main parties promised in their manifestos to respect the result. 87% of members of parliament were elected on the basis of a pledge that they would accept the referendum result. What does it say about our democracy, never mind our relations with the European Union, if those same MPs now turn around and renege on that central commitment? What's at stake here is nothing less than the standing of our democratic system. And the really extraordinary thing, the, the, the unbelievable frontier, the chutzpah, is for the same MPs who have spent two years doing everything they can to frustrate the process, to signal to Brussels that if only they're tough enough, the Brits might change their mind and, in Lord Kerr's phrase, come to heel. Those same MPs and peers now have the goal to say, oh, well, yeah, it's all turning out to be rather complicated. Let's have another referendum, when, of course, it's their own actions that have been frustrating it and seeking to capsize the result. This is about what kind of nation we are. Do we keep our promises? Do we expect politicians to do what they say when they stand and seek our votes? And do we believe in Parliament as a shorthand for the sovereignty of the people? This being Cambridge and the more radical of the two old universities, let me quote to you a level attract from 1647, their large petition which seems unusually apt to our present discontents. Such have been the wicked policies of those who from time to time have endeavored to bring our nation into bondage that they have in all times, either by the disuse or abuse of parliaments, deprived the people of their hope. Mr. President, ours is the nation that developed and exported the sublime idea that we should run our own affairs, we should be our own masters, we should govern ourselves, raise our own taxes, pass our own laws. It's that ideal that elevated and ennobled us among the nations. That has been our song to sing, always to the accompaniment of parliamentary democracy. Untune that string and hark what discord follows. Thank you for that speech, Daniel. Uh, before we move on with the rest of the main debate, um, we're gonna take a round of floor speeches. So I urge you to raise your hand, and uh, Stuart will come over to you. It's in the order of first, we have speeches from in points in favor of the proposition, then points in favor of the opposition, and then any points in abstention. Please try and make your speeches under a minute, and I'd like to remind you that on offer today, we have uh, vouchers for Pho, the Vietnamese restaurant. So 50 pounds of vouchers for the best floor speech tonight, so um, again, wait for your, the steward to get the mic to you, and name and college. So any points in proposition of the motion tonight? Um, that gentleman there, sure. Oh, Iman's good. Thank you. So uh, again, we have this problem where there seems to be an opposition to the May deal an opposition to no deal, an opposition to second RAF, what is it that is actually being proposed as the solution to this? Well, you didn't get that, you just got a bunch of criticism of second RAF. If there is a solution, it must surely be some kind of fantasy Brexit deal that the European Union will bend over and give the UK if the UK just demands it hard enough. As an American, I find this laughable and have always found it laughable. This is a weak country compared to the European bloc. It has limited negotiating power. And I'm reminded of the case of Greece. Greece, of course, had a referendum to reject the austerity proposal which the European Union intended to impose. And then it found that, well, actually, the European Union isn't willing to give it anything in response to that. And rather than plunge Greece into a depression and reintroduce the drachma, it backed off and went against its own referendum. That's happened before in Europe, and it will happen again, and it will happen every time a weaker European state
gets into a showdown with the entire bloc on its own in isolation. And people act like this is a British choice. Your choice will be an untenable deal, no deal at all, or to remain. That's been the choice from the beginning, and it will be the choice until you pick one of the three. And the Leave side is never going to be honest. They're always going to tell you there's a fantasy Brexit just around the corner that the Europeans will bend over and give you. Go look at Schauble. Go look at Merkel. Go look at those guys in the eye. Do you think they're scared? They're not scared. <laughs> Thank you for that speech. Any points in opposition of the motion now? Any? Oh, that's it. So, name and college first. Uh, Jerome Gasson, uh, Gerson College. I, I'd like to, I think the uh, opposition speaker made a very good speech. I'm not going to sort of add anything particular in that direction, but I feel that the terms of uh, any second referendum uh, would be too problematic. In order for a second referendum to really work as a democratic system, because are we going to vote as um, the president or ex-president suggested as uh, Theresa May's deal, or uh, remaining in the EU, or are we going to have some, something for no deal at all, which seems to be, although it was rejected in Parliament, it seems to be a relatively popular option amongst the populace. And if you've got these three options on the table, as we've had from the other uh, speak, speaker, then how are we going to make sure that they're e equally sort of valid? Because if we have all three in a referendum, then the leave vote is split between those who... Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, most people calling for people's vote want a uh, single transferable vote, so the leave voters wouldn't be able to split because of the <laughs> mathematics of it. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by a single transferable. Sorry, you can't ask points of information during a floor oh, speech. Well, it's all right. no, it's, but that was just my essential point, and um, do, there is probably an objection. But uh, I just wanted to raise the difficulty of like making sure that there isn't a split between Re Remain and all the different parties actually get there. So, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that speech, Jerome. So any points in abstention of the motion? So back there, the gentleman. It's Magdalen College. Um, I don't think Will needs to apologize for bringing this to us tonight. If Will had brought this motion to the House in December, and then after we discussed it, decided we couldn't have a vote on it, and then brought it back to us in January, and been heavily defeated, and then brought it back to us again this month, and then is gonna bring it back next week, then he could apologize that he was right to bring it tonight. I'm speaking in abstention because I think that um, the wording, I want, a, I want a people's vote, but the wording says a referendum on British membership of, of the European Union. The referendum we want now is not the same as the one that took place um, a few years ago. That was, if you like, in parliamentary terms, that was a second reading. It was on the principle of leaving the European Union. Now in Parliament, you then have committee stage, we have report stage, you go into it in great detail and you finally have a detailed bill which you vote on. That's where we are now with the whole question of what to do about Brexit. And that's why we should now have what in parliamentary terms you'd call a third reading debate. And given that parliament itself seems to be totally incapable of taking control of this process, despite allowing themselves to discuss it several times, surely now it's time to ask the people. Thank you for that speech. Uh, now we move on to the main debate. The next speaker on the proposition side is Amate Doku. Amate is a graduate of Jesus College and served as QSU president from 2016 to 2017. He is currently the vice president for higher education and a supporter of the People's Vote campaign. Amate, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and it's an absolute pleasure to be back in this chamber again. I also would like to try and widen the debate and not make some of the uh, quite predictable and cheap shots that can be made uh, at the opposition. Um, I know that there are lots of you know, very easy arguments that can be made, but I want to try and, as best as I can, 
uh, have a slightly more nuance uh, and, and um, try and extend on some of the points that the ex-president made. I want to sort of make three main points today. Firstly, the fact that we're having this debate shows that something has gone fundamentally wrong in the Brexit process. Second is that a people's vote is the only democratic option left to get us out of this mess. And the third is that that campaign will only win if we present a radical progressive agenda which tackles the deep-seated problems in this country which led to that, that vote in the first place. Now, um, unfortunately, Daniel's not here to hear my ruthless rebuttal, um, <laughs> but I will, um, I will weave it into my speech. On you know, my first point really tries to tackle this, um, the fact that, and I try to make it in the point of information, um, the fact that we're having this debate shows that something has gone completely wrong. I want to take you back to the 23rd of June, 2016. That's a day that holds real significance for me uh, personally because it was the day I graduated. And I remember that evening um, talking to one of my friends and almost joking, chatting in the common room, almost joking, can you imagine if we left the, the European Union? Well, obviously, here in uh, Remain Centrale, we got a bit of a, a, bit of a shock the following morning. Um, from our perspective, we were going to stay. Um, and I was, as many people were, absolutely devastated. Many of the people who voted remain absolutely devastated that we left. But I want to tell you that vote virtually no one, and I have to take issue um, with what the last speaker said, virtually no one was calling for another referendum. If anything, we were all very sort of shell-shocked by the, by the decision. Um, now, why is that? Well, because, as the ex-president pointed out, no one on either side actually knew what Brexit was. Uh, and I don't take that to take a, a cheap shot. It, it's a factual uh, it's a matter of fact, as we heard, in terms of the sort of the process. We, uh, we hadn't triggered Article 50. We hadn't had a detailed conversation as a country about what the deal uh, we wanted was. So what happens next? Well, um, well what should have happened next? <laughs> we know the story, but, but leadership. Leadership is what should have happened next. And if anything defines this period, it will be the catastrophic failure of leadership right across the political spectrum. My own personal view, uh, given that the main political parties had agreed to implement Brexit, was that some sort of cross-party commission could have been set up to draw up proposals, um, which could then command a majority in the House and then take that group to the European Union and bring the public along with us on that process. But that didn't happen. In fact, the very opposite happened, as we heard. Theresa May boxed herself in with her red lines, refused to countenance working with the opposition, and even after the disastrous 2017 election where she lost a majority, carried on as if nothing had changed. And there's a very good reason for that. And I'm sure many of you enjoy, enjoy coming to these debates. I, I definitely did as a student. Um, and I'm sure you, know, you learn a lot from these things, but you know, they're, they're quite uh, entertaining. You know, there are debates and competitions. Um, but I've been brought here to sort of persuade you, uh, the floor, that our side of the house is right, and this side of the house is wrong. Now, in the, on the unlikely scenario, perhaps, in this case, uh, that there is something on this side of the house that I agree with, ordinarily, I cannot admit that because I might be undermining my argument. And on the same, uh, sort of the, the other side of the coin, if there's something raised on this side of the house which I might disagree with, I can't, I can't admit that either because it's, it's a sign of weakness. And at the end of the debate, you're required to make up your mind. Which side of the house are you on? Uh, and there's no procedural mechanism for me uh, President, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no procedural mechanism for me to suspend this antagonistic clash and find a way of working together uh, on an outcome that everybody can get behind. Um, and in fact, the very architecture of the room uh, in this space signals that that's not how things should work. Now, that, there is an inherent problem with that in, in this context. In fact, uh, to make an analogy with a different competitive sport, I think it would be uh, Football would be pretty rubbish if rather than competing against each other, uh, the teams work together to score as many goals as possible collectively. I mean, no one, no one would watch that. Uh, but the problem is, somewhere along the line, someone decided that this was a good way of running a country. Um, and you don't have to be an expert in British constitutional history to see how exactly this system has demonstrably failed. I firmly believe that there was an opportunity to build a consensus across the House of Commons for a Brexit that would unite the country, but that uh, opportunity has been lost. The Prime Minister prioritised keeping her side of the House together over building that consensus, resulting in the complete and utter chaos that we see today. So given where we are, and this point has already been made, so I'll only touch on it briefly, the people's vote is the most, a people's vote is the most democratic way through this mess. 
we often get told that another referendum would be divisive. And I don't actually disagree. Referendums will be divisive. It will be happening in the context that politics has failed. But I want to ask the question to the opposition, and I want them to answer this uh, by, by the end of tonight. Which of the Brexit outcomes that parliamentary unilaterally decides will bring the country together? Which outcome is there that doesn't create more division? Because we get told that we're the side that wants to create division. Uh, and I just sim we simply don't have an answer. Leave is a split down the middle between May's deal and no deal, and there are a huge number of people who voted Remain who feel that their voices weren't heard in the process. Uh, and as I said previously, I was certainly of the view that there was a Brexit deal that could be struck, but I'm afraid I think it has gone far too late. And the reason why I ask the question uh, when the People's Vote campaign launched is because actually it's less than a year ago. It was actually only until uh, last year 2018, where we realized that we were running out of time, Theresa May's red lines would not have a Brexit deal um, that would unite the country and that would meet the concerns raised by many of the Remainers who did engage constructively with the conversation. So I would argue that whatever deal gets put to Parliament, who knows what they're going to be, what they're going to decide or not decide over the next couple of weeks, but whatever deal we end up with, whatever, wherever the EU get to and say that's the deal, that needs to be put to the people. The will of the people cannot undermine the will of the people, and that is so essential in this debate. But the final point I want to make, because I feel that this debate isn't made enough, but I, this, this argument isn't made enough, but I also think for those of us who are optimistic that we will get a people's vote, we need to shift our conversation. Because this referendum is an opportunity, not just to make the case technically for Remain and get, go along with our lives, uh, but to make the case for what sort of society we want to be and how to tackle the deep-rooted injustices uh, that resulted in many people feeling that they had to vote to leave the European Union. Because it's true that Brexit, any form of Brexit, has become clear over the last couple of years, will make this country poorer. It will limit the life chances of the young. It will cause untold damage to our standing in the world and turbocharge, this is a point that isn't made very often, turbocharge the cause for independence in the nations and break up the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think there is a mistake that's, uh, w uh, that we've made sometimes on this side of the house. You know, we like to shout facts at people and tell them that this is the economic reality that will be, that will be caused. That's essentially what the, the, the referendum, that parts of the Remain campaign did. But if you can't set out a positive vision of your country within the, in the EU, you will not win the argument. And I'm hugely inspired over the last couple of years uh, being involved in a lot of this work. I'm hugely inspired as I see the, a new generation of young people who've come to a political awakening around this issue. Uh, wanting to remain and lead in the European Union. Uh, and, and that is really the first step, because the reality is we live in a country where towns and cities are devoid of opportunities uh, for anyone, let alone the lung, young. Our, our politicians are more distant from people than ever before. Our health service is stretched. Public transport is out outpricing the public. A poverty crisis in big cities is creating a knife crime epidemic. We have significant regional inequality. And ultimately for us, we're set to be the first generation worse off than our parents. And there are also global problems, cybersecurity, climate change, a refugee and a migrant crisis, um, the worst we've seen for decades. Transnational corporations running roughshod over national governments, an impending climate crisis which threatens the world as we know it. And all these things are impacting communities across the country. And what's really interesting is if you look at the analysis between Leave and Remain, it's those of us here in this sort of, you know, graduates, um, more privileged graduates who have equi been equipped with a sort of global cultural capital which allows us to adapt and change to uh, uh, um, this sort of increasing and rapidly changing world. But it's those communities who haven't been given those tools who are saying loudly and clearly that this process of globalization is not serving us. It's created winners and losers, and that is where, and that is how our politics needs to shift. Um, and we can all agree that these are issues that need to be tackled. But I'm ashamed to say that it's those on the right, since 2008, the crash of the, 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 uh, uh, the banks, it's those on the right of, British, of, of politics in Britain, but also globally, who've got there first with a clear, coherent view of, their, their, of, of some solutions. And their solutions, isolationism, shutting yourself off from the rest of the world, privatization, tax havens, cracking down on immigration and blaming immigrants uh, and migrants for all the country's woes. And on top of that, we've seen tax cuts for the rich and powerful uh, with the dream of, of building this sort of free market utopia. And I think Brexit, Trump, and, and other isolationisms are all reactions to that. Uh, but I firmly believe, I firmly believe that these are not the solutions 
that will tackle the problems facing our communities. And I think it's time more broadly for the progressive left to find that voice and to set out that clear progressive radical agenda that will shape uh, our future and shape and build a movement around those ideas. If you really want to take back control, it's interesting that I think take back control was a fantastic, uh, fantastically powerful line to use because the reality is, as I was saying, we've been equipped with the global cultural capital which allows us to have some sense of control uh, over our lives. Uh, but it's those communities which simply haven't been able uh, to, to access that who have genuinely lost control over their lives. But we never, you talk about take back control, but it's almost in a, in a, in a bizarrely, just a sort of legislative sense, take back control of our laws, that's it. If you really want to take back control, how about proper investment in public services, better childcare support, actually controlling and, and public control of our utilities, fully funded tertiary education, progressive taxation so those at the top pay their fair share, devolving power, this is again not spoken about um, by the Leave campaign, what about devolving power to local communities so that they can make their decisions about their futures, encouraging and promoting immigration to meet the demands of our economy, and tackling um, climate change with our own, if you like, Green New Deal here, so that we can fully take charge, take back control over our, um, of our economy. Uh, and for our broken politics, I mean, we, we act, as I said, we need devolution, we need citizens' assembly, assemblies, um, and we need to make sure that our politicians are much more accountable than they are at the moment. And I think on the question tonight, and for this debate in particular, it's not about just being a rule taker, but being a leading, playing a leading role in Europe to tackle all the global challenges that we'll, we'll face over the next couple of years. So this is a radical agenda that we need to adopt. I think the left needs to find its voice in this conversation, uh, to rebalance the economy, to give young people those opportunities. And it begins, it doesn't end, it begins with the case to stay in the European Union. No Brexit option that we've seen today makes that agenda easier. No Brexit option demonstrates to the rest of the world that we're ready to lead and work together to face the global challenges. And no Brexit option meaningfully puts back control into the hands of ordinary citizens. So on those three points, about how our politics is broken, how it's the only democratic solution, and how we need to ensure that we truly give people back control, I believe that we need to put it back to the people. But I want to make a final point. I want to end on this. I have absolutely no doubt that our generation will ensure that the UK takes a leading role in the European Union. It is our only chance to tackle the global issues facing our world today. This debate tonight is simply a matter of timing, and I beg you to support this side of the House. Thank you. Thank you for that fine speech, Amate. The next speaker on theme opposition is James Vitali. James is an MPhil in international relations and politics at Christ College. He was employed by Mark Lancaster, the Minister of State for Defense, and was chosen for this debate by open audition. James, the floor is yours. Mr. President, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be taking part in this evening's debate. I think it is one of fundamental importance to our immediate future as a country, but I also hope to make clear uh, in what follows that this debate concerns the very essence and future viability of our particular form of democracy. The matter of the second referendum has been particularly problematic for me, perhaps more so than Daniel. Uh, many, as many I would guess in this room, I voted to remain in 2016, and I am a fervent believer that uh, Britain's interests are inextricably tied up with what goes on in Europe. I also have wrestled with problems I thought I'd resolved in my head as part of writing this speech. Uh, and, and despite what the previous speaker said, I don't think making those sorts of concessions is necessarily a bad thing. I was in competition with another member of parliament for the opportunity to speak this evening. Of course, my immediate conclusion was that the reason I am here uh, and he or she is not is down to the fact that I'm a, a more accomplished uh, and more polished speaker, of course. Uh, and has nothing to do with the fact that some important votes apparently are, are going on this evening. My self-assurance, ladies and gentlemen, rapidly dissipated when I remember how I got my place in this debate. Uh, we're here at the Cambridge Union, we have this fantastic initiative where uh, members audition for spots in the public debates. 
Uh, the problem is that the individual judging my audition was none other than the former president, uh, who is conveniently sitting opposite me this evening. Uh, the obvious deduction, my friends, is that the former president judged my speech to be so particularly dreadful, <laughs> so uniquely hopeless, that his chance of victory tonight were much higher if I, and not the unnamed member of parliament, was on his opposing team. I will leave the audience to decide. Anyway, on to my argument. I'm not going to rehearse some of the lines that the proposition thinks characterizes the argument against the second referendum, uh, that those who argue for one are sore losers or we should just get on with it. Uh, for despite my skepticism about the referendum, I don't think campaigners for another public vote are bad losers, and I don't think this is a decision that should be rushed or taken lightly. Given everything that has happened this last week and indeed these last few years, I know what this must look like. The political establishment seems to have manifestly failed to deliver on any sort of Brexit policy. And to get through this impasse, we should give the people another chance to provide an answer. We are compelled into looking at what is in di uh, directly in front of us by what is at stake. But reacting to events does not always make for good policy, and the ends do not always justify the means. The logic of the second referendum is persuasive in its simplicity, but it is dangerous. Regardless of what has happened this week, I want to argue that MPs were right to vote against the amendment on the second referendum this evening. I want to shift our attention to the longer term. Most importantly, I want to question the confidence in the apparent democratic potential of another vote, which I think stems from a misunderstanding about how our parliamentary system works. Friends, I want you to bear in mind throughout this debate that the issue of a referendum on our relationship with the European Union is not simply a technical question with a technical answer. It is a political question. And we must formulate our responses to it, not in terms of outcomes, much as that seems illogical, but in terms of the processes by which a decision is arrived at. I think we've lost a bit of focus thus far, ladies and gentlemen. The motion before us this evening is not whether we believe in a close partnership with Europe, or even about the type of relationship we want to have with the EU in the future. I happen to believe that we should retain a close association with our European allies. Nevertheless, this debate is about the specific instrument of the referendum used for a second time. At heart, I'm arguing that if we consider the United Kingdom to be a parliamentary democracy in which political authority ultimately resides with the people, then a second referendum, paradoxically, represents a unique and compelling threat to that system of government. The second referendum is frequently referred to as a people's vote, lending the potential plebiscite a democratic authenticity that I don't think it enjoys essentially. Now, you're probably thinking, how can I stand here and tell you that letting the people vote again would not necessarily be, the, uh, be democratic? Well, let's not be misled by the proposition. Voting isn't inherently democratic. Our efforts at democratization in places like Iraq have shown that simply institutionalizing the ballot box does not lead inexorably to democracy. Democracy is partly to do with institutions, like the vote, and partly to do with something else, something less tangible, something less material, but something no less important in stitching together the fabric of a democratic society. It is, in other words, the respect for and trust in the opinions of others that ensures the viability of democracy itself. For us to conceive of the second referendum as democratic, we need to place such a vote in the context of how government works in this country. And we would need to demonstrate that the vote is empowering people. On close inspection, it appears to me that our faith in the, uh, in the second referendum may be misplaced. Actually, I think a second referendum would inverse the relationship that should exist between the people and its parliament. As I have uh, noted, and is often noted, uh, Britain doesn't have a formally codified constitution. Uh, we have a series of fundamentally important documents, like the Magna Carta and the precedents provided by a corpus of acts of parliament. This constitution is relatively hardy, yes, but it has transformed. The balance of the power, for example, between commons, the lords, and the monarch has changed over time. Today, we might imagine that there are two aspects or two components to our parliamentary democracy. The sovereignty of the people and the sovereignty of parliament. The notion of popular sovereignty is, of course, foundational to any democracy and suggests that ultimate political authority resides perpetually and finally with the people. The notion of parliamentary sovereignty derives from the slightly more complicated theories of representative government. The British Parliament is understood to be a representative institution to which the people send legislators to promote not only their individual interests, but also to debate and to consider and act in the interests of the whole. We say that in this country, Parliament, or more precisely, the Queen in Parliament, is sovereign in that it has final jurisdiction over political decision-making. Now, I accept that there does appear to be a contradiction here, but if we look deeper, it's clear that that is not the case. The British people, 
as in any democracy, possess the authorizing and final authority in our society. They delegate power to a, a representative institution in Parliament, but they retain their ultimate authority in their ability to recall their representatives. The vital link between people and Parliament, between authorizing and instrumental power, is sustained by the people's ability to actively shape policy, actively shape policy through the referendum, uh, through the public sphere, through lobbying, and through the expression of opinions. The power possessed by Parliament is the gift of the people, and this is the basis of a form of government that remains the most free. Now, for me, a second referendum threatened these two inextricable pillars of our parliamentary democracy by setting a dangerous precedent which could potentially sever the linkage between the British people and their representative institution, and I shall try to explain why. As I see it, there are two principal reasons to have a second referendum, to reverse the current policy direction and remain in the EU, or to provide a specific form of exit with greater legitimacy. In the first case, the use of a second referendum would be incompatible with the values that democracy rests upon. It would be to say that the ultimate direction of policy, sh uh, policy should derive from politicians and not from the people who hold final authority. This, my friends, is to get the relationship in a democracy the wrong way around. Politicians can't simply elect a new public to authenticate their own views. Now, I don't uh, agree with the proposition's characterization of our position. I don't for one minute believe that there exists an abstract, unitary popular will which was somehow manifested in the vote to leave. But my point is this. A second referendum in this context suggests that the people are not the ultimate arbiters of the political direction of this country. Referendums don't essentially uh, suggest this, I concede. Indeed, they often do quite the adverse. But perceptions are important. And in this specific context, a second vote will be perceived as Westminster telling the general public that their views were wrong and that they must try again to make the right uh, choice. The 2016 referendum was not well thought out. We must face up to this. Yes, another public vote does not rectify the situation. It does, however, suggest that the people are to be just a, a passive audience, ask only to give their approval on certain occasions, but not to have any real bearing on the future direction of this country. It would leave us residing in a spectator democracy in which the people only have the option of agreeing or disagreeing with what people say, uh, the politicians say. This is not to empower the people, it's to emasculate them. A simple choice between agreement and disagreement does not constitute genuine power or control. Fundamentally, a second referendum pits popular and parliamentary sovereignty, which have always worked together in this country, against each other. Would another popular vote furnish greater legitimacy to any course of action? I am extremely doubtful, for it suggests that the answer given the first time round was unsatisfactory. And as soon as you judge the legitimacy of a vote by standards other than whether or not it garnered a majority, then you're on very dangerous down, uh, grounds indeed. Democracies rely on the principle that a decision is right or wrong based on whether it has a majority in a vote. There was a majority in 2016, albeit a slim one, and I do agree with the, the proposition's comments about not integrating the uh, very large minority um, as part of policy. But to ask the people the question again is implicitly to say that the vote's rightfulness is dependent on some standard independent and external to the political process. This is not democratic. Yes, the 2016 vote was poorly constructed. A binary choice, lacking thresholds, qualifications or caveats. I, I concede this. But we cannot retrospectively decide what parameters make a vote legitimate. One still has to confront the fact that over 17 million people, many of whom who felt ostracized and marginalized from the political process, voted to leave the EU. The very act of holding another referendum questions the validity of their vote the first time round. I certainly did not advocate the identity politics of some or the arguments about immigration that were made at the time. But for me, to call another vote reflects a tendency to simply view this as a problem with the answer that was given, and not with the politicians who should ultimately be accountable for what they said and did. Perhaps more foundationally, a second vote doesn't get rid of the factors uh, that animated those who voted to leave initially, as the last speaker said. It is entirely possible, perhaps even likely, that Russian involvement too might have affected some voters. But to say that Russian involvement characterized or invalidated every vote to leave is just a form of inductive reasoning that I can't assent to. There were people with very well-formed views and legitimate reasons for wanting to leave the European Union. And their votes cannot be reduced to a byproduct of manipulation. If we assume the rationality of voters, my friends, we have to assume it for both sides of the debate. So it is with some amusement that I find myself agreeing with the Prime Minister. Insufficient attention has been given to the very material damage the second referendum would do to our parliamentary democracy. I don't think Mrs May, however, is a particularly good guide to the political philosophy of democracy. 
So in concluding my speech this evening, I want to leave you with the thoughts of two scholars, one old and one new. Alexis de Tocqueville, perhaps the most foremost guide here, said democracy is not good for the outcomes that it produces. And I think we would do well to bear this in mind. Democracy is not the best form of government because it guarantees effective outcomes. Indeed, sometimes autocracies are more efficient and they're more effective. Democracy is the best form of government because it is the most free. Democracy's greatest asset is that it is a process for achieving collective decisions which institutionalizes and protects liberties, privileges, and the rights to opinion for all, and not just some. As Nadia Urbanati has suggested more recently, the uncertainty of the result and the openness of the game of politics are the most precious outcomes of democracy. It is the process of democracy that a second referendum threatens, and on this point I do agree with Daniel. We have had in recent years a general election in which 80% of the vote, or over 80% of the vote, was won by parties standing on promises to carry out the first referendum result. By s yes. Eighty percent of the vote might have been won by parties who were in favour of leaving the EU, but it was not won by members of Parliament who were in favour of the EU. Witness our own MP in Parliament, Daniel Zeichner, who is a member of the Labour Party, which was in favour of implementing the results of the referendum, and he has very clearly declared that he is in favour of the opinion of the people of Cambridge of not implementing the result of the referendum. My learned gentleman, uh, my learned friend, uh, as he so often does, makes a very good point. But I would say that there have been a series of votes in Parliament too that have confirmed the process, including the, uh, the votes this evening and also the vote to initiate the Article 50 process at the start. Um, by suggesting that only one outcome to the question of our relationship with the EU is right, we deny the moral underpinnings of democracy. Our political associations are not invincible. They're not unassailable. If full emancipation is a predicate of a modern democracy, then ours is only about 100 years old, which is fairly young in historical context. We cannot afford to be cavalier about the constitutional implications of our political decisions. What is a referendum? It is an occasion when a representative institution asks the people to provide their opinion on a question of basic importance. Sometimes they can be democratically constructed. In the context we are discussing, however, a second vote would undermine democratic processes and would inestimably damage our society. For these reasons, I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to avoid the siren of a second referendum and to oppose the motion this evening. Thank you for that speech, James. Before we move on to the last two speakers of tonight's debate, um, we're going to move to one more round of floor speeches. So, Again, reminding that there's five vouchers uh, for tonight's debate. So any points in proposition of the motion? So back there, the gentleman with the long hair. Thank you, Chair. Andros of Homerton College. The opposition made a beautiful speech about democracy, a wonderful speech, a speech about emancipation, about voting, about equality, about liberty. Yet the opposition does not realize reality. There is no other way to get out of this mess, and the opposition continues to deny this. They continue to believe that there is a fantasy Brexit option which they can carry out. The fact is that there is not a majority in Parliament for a no deal vote, for a no deal Brexit, sorry. There is not a majority in Parliament for May's deal, however much she wants to amend it, and the European Union will not give us. Uh, a leaving deal that we want because it is the, in the EU's interest to not give us good conditions so that we will stay. Therefore, having ruled out all those other options, the only option remaining to us to get out of this horrible mess in the first place is to do a second referendum. Not because we want to or because we're divided by partisan politics or because we respect democracy, but because it is the only way out. Thank you. Thank you for that speech. Um, any speeches in opposition of the motion? Um, the gentleman there. Um, so, uh, Maud, uh, Tristan Byrne, Maudlin College. Um, this is a point that the opposition kind of touched on, but I think like it's important to stress is like how divided the country would be if there was a second referendum and we voted against or 
voted for remaining within the EU, right? Like, there would be decades of, um, like, divisiveness in the country and potentially, like, a massive wave of populism, right? Um, and I think that's just important to recognize. Thank you for that speech. So any last points in abstention of the motion? Um, the gentleman there. I think there's a mic there. Uh, Benjamin Morgan from Queens College. Um, so I have kind of a, uh, an, it's an abstention play. It's a bit of an odd, an odd one, but I think I've got the solution because you said there's no other option but to have a second referendum. But you do live in a constitutional monarchy. You've got, you've got Liz over there in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> she is your representative to government. And they've already had two uh, instances of the humble address, which is when people in Parliament appealed to the Queen to get documents out, which was something that hasn't been done since like the early 19th century. So she's already like slightly been involved. So you might as well just you know, give it over to her and let her, let her solve this for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Benjamin. So now moving to the final speaker and to close the proposition's case, Luke Hallam. Luke is a second year studying history and politics at Trinity and is the union's executive officer for next Michaelmas term. Luke was chosen by open edition for this debate. The floor is yours, Luke. Well, first of all, thank you, Abdullah, um, and a big thank you to Will for what's been an amazing term. Um, you might have noticed I'm not Ming Campbell. He was supposed to be coming. I can only apologize for that. Um, I wish I was him. <laughs> so I saw a great tweet this morning, um, and this tweet said, Brexit is the new fire festival. <laughs> um, this was, of course, the festival planned last year to take place in the Bahamas. It was supposed to be the most ambitious event of its kind, an island would be transformed into a luxury resort with all the best artists, models, and social media influencers taking part. But when the guests, who paid thousands of pounds, arrived, they found that the roads were still being built, the mattresses were wet, there were no bands, the food consisted of pre-packed sandwiches, and they had to sleep in tents normally supplied by the US government to victims of hurricane disasters. It was organized by a handful of people who had absolutely no idea what they were doing. They had considered cancelling at the last minute, but then just decided to go ahead after one of them said, let's just do it, we'll be legends. Um, that's true. Um, we've now got to the Bahamas. We found that nobody has any idea how to solve the problems we're facing, um, including, of course, that of the Irish border. We have no choice but to prolong the process, as MPs voted to do only a couple of hours ago. Because the inherent contradictions in the positions of all the major actors here are simply unsolvable. And so the years are ticking away, and we're being told to line up and accept second best because of a vote based on a mixture of spurious claims as well as legitimate grievances that the elites of our country were simply ignoring. Let's not be naive about this. What we are arguing on this side of the house could be dangerous. Referendums are not good ways of dealing with complex issues. Until relatively recently, they were unknown in British politics. But this whole Brexit process is turning the rules on their head. We are living through extraordinary times of crisis. Does it have any precedent? Well, there was the crisis of the Depression and World War II. There was the crisis of the late 1970s. Out of both of these crises emerged new ways of doing politics, namely the welfare state and Thatcherism. We're now living through a crisis that has emerged in the wake of the 2008 crash. We don't know yet what the history books will have to say about it. Uh, more importantly, everything is still up for grabs. The new way of doing politics that will emerge out of this crisis, and I think it's safe to assume that one will, has yet to be determined. But before that, we have to solve Brexit, kick populism back into the can, fix the economy, and find a way to stop everyone being so grumpy and argumentative. So why have a referendum? Well, first, there's the simple and compelling, compelling fact that Brexit is an enormous word. The confusion we're living through is partly as a result of the arrogance of the Remain campaign. They didn't feel the need to specify how Brexit would work if they lost. And I know it's a cliche, but it's an incredibly important point. 
yes, we can see some common themes about why people voted out, anti-immigration being one, um, and those of us who voted Remain probably didn't do a very good job of conveying the facts about immigration. But Brexit is so much more than that, as we're coming to discover. Why would the late Tony Benn have wanted Brexit, probably? Why does Arthur Scargill want Brexit? If Brexit as a concept is something that is even remotely coherent, we can only assume that these left-wing firebrands want to be out of the European Union for the same reason as the aristocratic Jacob Rees-Mogg or the capitalist millionaire Tim Martin. Yes, several bemused centrists could no doubt make the case for that being true, um, but I disagree. There was a black box at the heart of this Brexit process, and in the scrabble to claim ownership over it, the nationalist and right-wing forces of this country have come out on top. But we should have the guts to say, not in our name. The principle of a people's vote is quite simple. Hardly anyone likes the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. That has now been made clear twice. It's probably the one aspect of Brexit around which there is something resembling a consensus. One way a people's vote could occur is if Parliament agrees to a withdrawal agreement on the basis that is put to a referendum. This seems quite sensible to me. It would break the impasse, get the ball rolling, and then we can say, now we know. Now we know what Brexit looks like. If the deal wins, we leave on those terms, and the government will be free to negotiate a trade deal with the European Union. What is the alternative option to be? Well, there's discussion about having a three-way referendum with no deal on the ballot, or having a binary choice between Remain and May's deal. Now, I'm not here to say which one of these is better, um, because the principle remains the same. The principle that a vote to leave the European Union is so enormously complicated, with so many different potential outcomes, that it makes absolutely no sense to tie ourselves to that vote that we had in 2016. I've talked to people who say they just want politicians to get on with it. Um, I think we have to accept that this is now becoming impossible. Even if things weren't so completely ground to a halt, even if it was possible to get on with it during the extension period of Article 50, which we're now hopefully going to get, it is perfectly legitimate for the people of this country to have a say on the outcome of the most important negotiations this country has conducted in generations. And I say the most important negotiations. That's only true until we have to spend months and months actually negotiating a trade deal of unprecedented scope, which we're going to have to do once we've worked out how we're going to leave in the first place. So much of this has been decided at the last minute and is, according to the people who know best, a joke. We've probably been saved from dropping out without a deal on 29th of March. That's if the EU agreed to extend Article 50. But what if this happens? You know, the government were planning on giving businesses just over two weeks to prepare for various significant rises and reductions in tariffs. There's not even certainty about whether these plans were legal as far as they pertain to the Irish border. If we had dropped out without a deal, the government would have granted visas of a maximum of three years to university students taking part in courses of four years or longer. It's madness. In short, we now know what Brexit looked like. It's a complete mess, and the country is fed up with it. Um, Daniel Hannan made the point that it was legitimate for people to call for the 2016 referendum because the terms had changed. The same thing is true now, or to be more specific, the terms haven't changed. There are now terms that weren't before. But we can't fall into the trap again of only focusing on economic arguments. Um, they did some polling after the referendum that revealed the Remain and Leave voters were just as likely as each other to say that capitalism is a bad thing. So what did they differ on? They differed massively on their attitudes towards feminism, social liberalism, and the environmental movement. 78% of Leave voters consider feminism a force for ill. 71% consider globalization a force for ill. It's one of the most illuminating polls I've ever seen. Economics doesn't work, identity does. Although, of course, economic security can probably compound cultural insecurity. And, and this is the failing of the European Union. It's a failing of Blairism, of the coalition, of elites around the world. People want a sense of belonging. What they've got is an embittered nation that now can't agree on anything. What they've got is a distant institution in a world growing ever bigger, more farcical, and less certain by the day. It's fine for us liberals, you know, because we have plenty of things to invest meaning in. Our liberal ideology is a sort of religion for us. But plenty of people don't hold it, and that's how we ended up in this mess. I spoke at the beginning about uh, the new forms of politics that arose from previous crises. We need to create a new form of politics that reconciles all the values that us liberals hold dear with the people who don't believe that a globalizing world is working for them. If we leave the European Union, there's still going to be immigration, you know, because we simply need it. It'll just be coming from a different place. If the hardline Brexiteers get their way, 
Britain will become a bargain basement economy that in many ways is even more globalized than it is now. All of this is becoming apparent. People are disillusioned with the process. They'll be disillusioned if we crash out and cause massive uncertainty, new tariffs, and queues at Dover. They'll be disillusioned if they found out that, because of the withdrawal agreement, everything the Brexiteers said was the case before the referendum actually comes true. That is, we're forced to accept rules from Brussels without having any say over them whatsoever. There is no outcome for Brexit that will not cause disillusionment for millions of people. We set ourselves on this road back in 2016. I said it before. Now we know how utterly farcical the situation is. We need to break the deadlock by putting it to the people. We need to grasp this as an opportunity to end the culture wars, just as the brief period of liberal complacency that we were living in until 2008 came to an end also. We need to move forward. It is perfectly legitimate for the people of this country to take control of the most complicated national process we've had to undergo in many decades. Now we know what a Brexit process looks like. I urge you to vote on this side of the House as a call to make our country do better, and I invite you all to join us on Saturday the 23rd for the People's Vote March. Thank you. Thank you for that great speech, Luke. So to close the case for the opposition and to conclude the debate as a whole, we have Abiram Bibiker. Abiram's a first year studying natural sciences at Christ College and is part of the union's committee next term. Abiram was chosen by open audition for this debate and the floor is yours, Abiram. Mr. President, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to just start by saying what a pleasure it is to be speaking before you today. Uh, and I'd particularly like to thank Will and Rachel for hosting open editions for this slot. Uh, again, I'd like to echo Luke in saying that I'm very sorry that I'm not the MP that was meant to be speaking here today, but um, it's just the nature of the uncertainty uh, that surrounds Brexit and has guessed in influenced this debate as well that I instead am speaking before you today. So um, I'd like to talk exactly on that point, uncertainty. My underlying argument today is that prolonged uncertainty is the worst thing we can have. Prolonged uncertainty has a lot of very real impacts. It halts people's plans to study abroad. It puts families living across the Irish border in jeopardy. It drives businesses out of this country and it cuts jobs and it ends people's livelihoods. Prolonged uncertainty is the thing that we should be opposing and that we should unite to limit as much as we can. And today I'm going to put before you two points today on why a second referendum would prolong uncertainty and leave us ultimately directionless. So my first point, what would a second referendum actually entail? So there's been a lot of talk on uh, the proposition. Um, Will brought up perhaps a binary vote. Um, Luke brought up the idea that there may, may be a three-option vote. So um, that's another question that somewhere down the line, if there were to be a second referendum, would need to be answered. And the key thing, the key premise for the case for se uh, a second referendum is the fact that it would be different to the first. Otherwise, there would be no sense in having another referendum for no reason. It's just not, not a fun thing to do. It's very painful, it's very decisive, it has very many harmful outcomes, as we've seen when we did the first referendum. So what would we need to make it fundamentally different from the first referendum? Well, we need some sort of system by which the people would be able to express um, a leaning towards what type of exit they would like if they wanted to leave the EU, whether that be a no deal or to take the deal that Theresa May has negotiated for us and that is put before us today, or whether they'd like to remain within the EU. So I think the easiest way to do this is through a three option ballot. And then the other crucial part of this second re referendum pledge is the necessity for it to be decisive. We can't have another marginal result. We can't have another 52-48, because then, as Daniel expressed earlier, then this almost becomes a game. It almost invites people to say, best of three, 
best of five. Let's make this, this a monthly occurrence, a yearly occurrence. There's no sense in that. So we need something that has three options that accurately expresses what, what the uh, electorate want and accurately like, shows us that it's not, a, it's not a marginal result, that this is actually what the people want. And I'm going to tell you that this is basically an impossible shopping cart. This is something that will never really happen. And even if we will try to aim for something very close to this, it's just a long struggle that prolongs uncertainty, which is something that I would like to convince you, and I hope that you agree, is ultimately the worst thing that can come out of this whole situation. So what are the different options for having a three-option three, uh, ballot? So um, this is a bit more of a technical point, but um, I think there are three main ideas or, um, I guess, solutions to having these, meeting this shopping list of requirements. So the first would be, um, the first would be um, a two-round vote. So we'd vote first off to say no deal or deal, and then we'd go for a second round of voting on whether we leave or remain. So this is, I think, the best option. It would take a lot of time. It'd be two rounds instead of one. Remainers could, however, game the system. If they think that no deal would lose out to remain, then they'll vote for that instead of actually expressing their true uh, ambitions, even if they think that deep down deal is better than no deal. So this system is not perfect. It's not really a fair outcome. There's, then there's the other option, an AV vote, similar to a runoff vote, where you'd give ranked uh, preferences. So if one option received 50 first preference votes, then that naturally wins. I think that's very, very unlikely given the mess we find ourselves in today. Um, otherwise, the one with fewest first option votes would get eliminated and the second choice votes would be distributed along uh, to the remaining options. This tends towards extreme outcomes, not compromise. And compromise is something that we definitely need currently. And it's also open to gaming. Voters could eliminate one option if they believe that ultimately they'll win with the second votes are redistributed. So this is something that doesn't really give us a fair result. And then the third is a bit more exotic idea, an idea from France, so um, maybe not in, in the spirit of Brexit. Um, but it's a more, slightly more complicated idea, which would require educating the electorate on what it would entail, but it's an A versus B, B versus C, and C versus A, with the three options. And if A wins two, two out of the three uh, rounds uh, on the same ballot, then it's the victor. But this would, could actually lead to deadlock, because you could have a situation where A beats B, B beats C, and then C beats A, and then we're back in a mess. So. <laughs> There's no real easy way to hold a second referendum. I think this is something that the proposition needs to realize and that the general public needs to realize. We've been told a lot about an easy solution, that this will break the deadlock, that we'll suddenly have a second ref referendum and see the light. The country will unite and will suddenly all agree that the second re referendum's result will be the one that we actually want to proceed forth with. Actually, this is actually quite a difficult thing to do and actually having the process of a second referendum is such a difficult task. And this, there's actually a paper on this, if you want to read this, published by Kenneth Arrow about suboptimal outcomes, published in 1951. This also, uh, <laughs> this also assumes that everyone would participate in a second referendum. As Daniel touched upon, um, there's a huge chance that uh, Leave voters will see that there's another referendum, feel extremely angry, as they've already shown their distaste on Facebook, YouTube, comments, everywhere. There's a very vocal, vocal minority or maybe majority, we don't really know, I mean, that's the point of second referendum, I guess, um, that, that really do not want to see a second referendum. So they would, sorry, not at this point, um, that would actually maybe just spoil the ballot, not turn up. And then where do we leave ourselves? Another referendum with a meaningless result. So that's something that we will need to take into account. Then on to the implications of having a, um, a fantasy second referendum in which we did get a decisive result and we did have a clear direction. Then, for example, suppose that we did actually go for a remain. That's some, simply an outcome that would not unite the country because when we saw with the first referendum, the Remainers did not give up. There was admittedly no um, re like reaching out 
of the Leave side to build some sort of consensus, have some cross-party um, collaboration. That was something that did not exist. But I think there's also a very strong possibility that if Remain were to win a second referendum, that they would indeed um, leave Leave voters um, out in the cold, and Leave voters would be very, very angry. And then there's also the fact of the matter that Remain two years ago is not the same Remain we find ourselves faced with in a potential second referendum. Things have changed. The EU is now in driving in the front seat, and they have all the power, they have all the betting chips. In the sense that we would first need to negotiate Article 50, there'd be conditions on that, and there's also, um, sorry, no thank you, and there's also the, the um, looming prospect of EU um, Parliament elections. They're, they're joking in Brussels right now that the UK, if Remain were to um, succeed in, in a second referendum, that we would elect 73 Nigel Farages to represent ourselves in the European Parliament. That's something that does not scream um, stability, that does not scream consensus. All that says to me and should say to you is prolonged uncertainty and no escape from the nightmare we find ourselves waking up to every day. Um, so, where does this leave us? Um, I think the truth is, we shouldn't even be having this debate today. This was never, this, I'd like to take you two years back, this, this was never really a direct democracy decision. There's a reason we have representative democracy, it's to handle hugely complex issues and hugely complex questions such as the one of Brexit. Do we have a no deal? What sort of uh, customer relationship do we have? What sort of outcome do we want for our future? That's something that's ultimately a representative democracy is best positioned to handle, not a simple binary vote, not direct, it's not a direct democracy question. And we ultimately have David Cameron to thank for this mess we're in today. Um, I would like to personally say that um, I would actually back a second referendum, but not one in which that would exist <laughs> in reality. I'd, I'd, like, I'd back one in a fantasy world where it would actually, it's a horrible point to say, but um, where, where it would break the deadlock. I'd like to dream that there would be some sort of magical um, sun, sun, like the clouds apart, we'd be in a sunny world where everyone would, you know, unite, people would put down the, the divisive arguments that they had leading up to a second referendum, and we'd all go on into the future and focus on more important things. Uh, sorry, no thank you, I'm running out of time. And this brings me back to um, what the proposition said, um, particularly Amity. Um, there are things that um, would unite this nation, and I think it's almost a cop-out answer, but that thing is time. I think what we need to do is recognize the growing support. Um, the ERG, I think, I read an article today, are uh, almost um, coming round to Theresa May's deal. I think the DUP as well are now realizing the reality of the situation, and they're th potentially going to throw back their support in, uh, t towards Theresa, May, uh, Theresa May's deal. So there, I think that's the, the best way to go forward. Take that deal, maybe have some potential renegotiation, and then be done with the process. In that way, we respect what happened in 2016, but we also leave the door open to gain consensus, sorry, no thank you, to ga gather consensus and maybe have a more um, informed uh, approach to this um, 10 years, 20 years down the line. I think there's something that's been hugely overlooked in all of this discussion, this debate we're having today, and it's the huge domestic um, lack of attention that domestic issues are receiving. And ultimately, these are the things, as Amity rightly pointed out, that fueled uh, the Vote Leave campaign, that, re that um, fueled people's intense dissatisfaction with the establishment, that sent them out in their droves to support Brexit, whatever that may have meant in 2016. And these are the things that we should be seeing, these are the things that we need to be discussing in Parliament, that we need to be addressing, knife crime, poverty, um, all of those issues, that far too many to list in the time that I don't have. Um, so I'd like to leave you on a positive thing that um, sort of got washed away in this past week. And that's the, um, I think it's the spring statement that um, Philip Hammond announced that 
um, he's going to bring an end to period poverty in some sense, in that um, he's going to bring out, uh, he's pledged to um, bring free uh, sanitary products um, and tampons to schools um, across the UK, uh, something that should have happened a long, long time ago, but um, is almost certainly a good thing that's happening now. I think these are the sort of domestic policy successes that we should be celebrating, and these are the sort of domestic policy things that I want to be seeing resolved in the future five years from now, not squabbling over a second referendum, not being stuck in this endless nightmare. I just want to really move on, really. <laughs> so um, that's it. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a great day. Thank you, Abiram, for that speech. Before we conclude tonight's event, um, just three small things. Firstly, I'd like you to join me in thanking tonight's speakers for um, what, have been, is, what has been an excellent debate and a very engaging one at that. Um, secondly, in helping make tonight happen, our amazing AV team and stewards who really made the event happen. And last, but certainly not least, Will and his excellent committee team for what's been a great term and a great debate tonight. Um, secondly, so just explaining the procedure here at the union, we vote with our feet, so um, when I finish my speech, just going through those three doors there, the middle ones for abstentions, and the other two are marked. So, um, on the third point, join us in the bar if you made a floor speech today, the, uh, where we'll, uh, we will announce the results, and um, the best floor speech speaker will be announced there as well. We hope you enjoyed this debate tonight and what's been a really engaging Lent term as a whole, and we hope to welcome you in Easter at the Union with a new term card. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you.